So am I, uh, am I being shared? Can you see my screen? Yep. All right. But I think you have to change your sharing. If you go to your sharing um, settings, you can say use the audio output from the computer. I think right now it's picking up just your mic. Oh, okay. Um, mm. It usually is in, in the share um, button. There's like some audio option that's usually there. Share computer sound. There we go. Yeah. All right. I'll hit it again. George Washington University's Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship is the vibrant hub for innovative activity across campus, providing vital programming that includes education, mentorship, and venture creation designed to help all students realize their entrepreneurial and social enterprise dreams. As the focal point for entrepreneurial activity at GW, the OIE supports student projects at all stages. Ideas for businesses, part-time side hustles, existing companies, fledgling startups, everything in between, and helps them grow and develop to their fullest potential. Students who are curious about problem solving and creating an impact in their communities can benefit from our programs. The Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship offers an access point to all of the school's resources, um, both in entrepreneurship and reaching out to resources in the broader community. We bring exclusive educational opportunities to our students, designed to replicate real-world business scenarios. Industry experts broaden students' horizons through a highly specialized curriculum and experiential education. I think the office first started me off with opening up my own mind to the possibilities where I can create impact. The OIE's fellowship programs offer students long-term paid opportunities to work at the office while studying for a career in entrepreneurship. The OIE helps students plug into a network of like-minded peers, experienced mentors, and valuable business connections. The office's INE lab offers a physical location for the GW community to gather, explore new ideas, and connect with resources to turn passions into new business and social impact ventures. Robust and well-established virtual programming unites GW students and mentors from across the country and around the world. The INE lab provides the physical and intellectual resources GW students need to grow, including one-to-one -one advising, workshops, events, and access to a network of accomplished entrepreneurs eager to help students develop as future innovators. The most helpful resource that the Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship has provided me was a community of mentors that allowed me to make sense of what entrepreneurship really meant. Being paired with a mentor is the best thing ever. The OIE's G Women program empowers students committed to women's entrepreneurship and the GW Innovation Exchange helps students find potential collaborators, connects them with a global GW network of industry experts, and provides access to jobs and internships in startups and social enterprises. The Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship is a community. We have actual offices which are fantastic. Um, they help us engage with other entrepreneurs. They're able to connect us with funding, all the important startup things. In addition to educational programming and networking, the OIE offers a number of funding opportunities. At the new venture competition, students vie for a half a million dollars in prizes. Over $10,000 per year is available to students in the form of travel grants. The OIE assembles an annual cohort of student entrepreneurs for the GW Summer Startup Accelerator which organizes and funds nine weeks of business development, networking, and education for participants, culminating in live pitches to actual investors. That's an experience that someone like me, someone my age or with my background, just isn't going to get every day. No matter the stage of the idea, no matter the experience of the student, the OIE has resources that can help. We equip every GW student, faculty, and staff with the tools and confidence to pursue their business ideas, innovate in their fields, and create meaningful, lasting global impact. I think entrepreneurship is very scary. 
to a lot of people unless you've actually done it. The Office of Innovation and Entrepreneurship, they've helped me grow and really turn my project into a functioning business um, that's able to fundraise, able to get academic and government grants, um, able to turn research into a product. Sign up for a newsletter and schedule a conversation to learn more about how our resources can help your idea blossom. Entrepreneurs are leaders, innovators, inventors, and pioneers. The OIE is here to connect students with the skills, community, and resources they need to follow their passions and begin long, successful journeys in entrepreneurship. It's honestly just inspiring to see all these people working so hard on things they really believe in. I never imagined starting a company right after graduating. Without the GW experience, I don't think I'll be doing this. If you really want it, if you're really putting in the effort, it's possible. So that is a video clip that's intended to, to, to do the, what I'm trying to do today with you guys in 10 minutes, which is just to give you a sense of the resources, the rich set of resources that are available to you as uh, GW students. And um, I, I will just run through them quickly. This, this slide deck, by the way, is I, I put it on the Slack channel. I think I put it in events. Um, there's also a list of our calendar events. But uh, the point is, um, well, that's me. That's my contact information. Right? So you can always reach out to me. Um, lots of programs, lots of resources for anybody at any stage of, of uh, their commercial, their innovator's journey, as we call it. It's a, an experiential component. Um, and the journey starts with early education exploration and goes all the way to uh, growth, uh, sustainable ex uh, expansion, and, and, and ultimately to exit. So. Um, let me just get to the list of things that we offer. Um, you saw the Innovation Exchange. That's on the top of the list because I think it's particularly useful for, for the, you guys. We would love to get you involved in this community. It's an online community of innovators. It's a place where students go to find uh, startup ventures to join, and it's where startup ventures go to look for students to, to join their ventures. So it's a great way to connect with people. It also has a community of 200 plus uh, innovators, uh, uh, mentors, who have volunteered their time to work with you on, on, on your idea. Uh, there's a, a special program for women. We do have the mentors in residence. Uh, let me uh, show you the mentors in residence. There are uh, eight mentors in residence, experienced mentors who come to campus every, every day uh, to, and do office hours, virtual come to campus. Uh, again, you can make an appointment with them and, and talk to them. There are also student peer, peer, near peers. There are five students who are experienced in the programs who great to talk to and can give you advice. There is the Innovation Center, uh, the makerspace over in Tompkins Hall, a little hard to get at these days, but a great, great place. And they, and they are doing virtual programs for, for makers. We do do a, a, a National Science Foundation supported program called uh, the i program. It starts with a three hour uh, lean innovation workshop um, we have space over in Tompkins Hall that will open up, at, that's not Tompkins, but in uh, uh, 2000 Penn, which will open up uh, someday and we'll get back to being, when we get back to being human beings. Um, the i program uh, has a two week version with a $3,000 grant from the National Science Foundation to teach you how to talk to customers or prospective customers about your technology. And then there's the national NSF program, which we also run here, uh, which is a seven week program with a $50,000 grant that comes with it. Um, right now, if you have an idea, you should be signing up for Pitch George. Pitch George is the School of Business's elevator competition. It starts up, uh, I think the registration is open now. No, registration opens uh, on Monday um, and the, the competition goes in the, through, the, through the fall, but you can win up to $1,000, uh, nice money. And then there's the new venture competition. This is the big competition that we run in the spring, GW's competition is one of the biggest in the country, top 10 uh, for several years. And then we run the Summer Accelerator, I mentioned that. Um, also in the, in the Slack is a list of all of our programs this, this, this semester. There are several events that, uh, that will, will be interesting to you. The networking events, there's a fireside chat this afternoon. Um, there's lots of uh, workshops on mobile design, boot camps to take your idea in a, in a weekend, push it as far as you can. 
And then the one thing I would ask you to do is to sign up for our newsletter. If you go to our website, innovation.gw.edu, you can get on the newsletter that comes out every week. And that's the best way to stay connected to, to what's happening. So I'll stop. That's me. That's my contact information. Don't hesitate to reach out to me. And I think we have maybe a minute for a question or two. Yeah, thanks, Lex. Um, yeah, if anyone has questions, uh, um, it sounds like Ruben's already very familiar with your programs, but some done some work with Ruben have. already. That's right. Love it. One of my favorite places. Yeah, thank you. All right, gang. Well, then I, I, I think I'll quit. Thank you for okay. having me. Appreciate uh, the time. I'm, and I'm sorry it's intruding, but I have a question. No, go. Yeah, go. Yeah, I have. Well, let me introduce first. Um, I'm new here in this group. My name is Jose. I'm a master's student at Data Analytics at the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Great. Yeah, and well, I would like to know a little bit about how you are working right now with the situation you know, with this, uh, like, a remote mode instruction. Um, how are you like working on this under these conditions? Well. It, it... You, you, I, I suspect you already know the answer. Just everything is remote. So all of our products, uh, all of our programs, all of our workshops, all of our networking events, all of our speakers are all being done online right now. Um, I don't don't go to campus. I haven't been there in five months. Um, the the make the space that we have in uh, 2000 Penn is essentially closed. I mean, it, it, it's open. The landlord is open, but it's not. GW students aren't allowed in there. Um, so. We're just making, doing the best we can. The upside is that people can drop in, you know, on a Zoom call. You don't have to. You can do it in your pajamas, right? You can, and you can do it from anywhere. So our outreach is 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 a little broader in that sense, but um, you know, it doesn't have the same same feel to it. That this is so much of entrepreneurship is collaborative and requires networking, and so we're we're just making the doing the best we can, Jose. Okay. Is that is that responsive to your question? I mean, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's we ran the summer accelerator this year all virtually. So, uh, and again, the, the same sort of pattern. We had we had people in you know in, in Saudi Arabia and Scotland who participated, never would have, but the group never got together physically. There was no the sense of camaraderie. wasn't wasn't the same. So I'm I'm counting the days until we can get back on campus. I really miss it. <laughs> yes, me too. Thank you. Jose, are you a, a first year in the program this year? Yes. Yeah, I'm first year in the program. Okay. Well, wel welcome. I'm. I'm also. Uh, I'm a professor in EMSE, so I might uh, see you around one day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Hopefully, huh? Same thing. We are. We are all remote, obviously. Um, but I. I. I just want to note how the the, res the physical resources are really, uh, really wonderful, and um, you know the the building, the space uh, is really, really nice. So, I yeah. hope one day you will get to see this. Um, Oh, yeah. If not in the spring, my, my biggest hope is for next fall uh, that we'll be able to join there. Um, there is just a lot uh, that is hard to replicate online, especially in the creative thinking phases. <laughs> so one day we'll get there. Yeah. Okay. Someday. And that said, generally offered the 2000 pen space for this group to meet in if we were going to be able to meet in person. Um, so we had planned to meet there back in March before the shutdown. Right. Yeah. Yeah. The 2000 here. Penn space is perfect for this group, right? It's a great place to get. Yeah. It's not quite off campus, but and you can get together and socialize and that and that's we, what's intended for. Yeah. We do have an unofficial, not GW sanctioned meetup today <laughs> <laughs> in person, uh, off campus in person, uh, if y'all want to get together. Um, but that's, that's posted in the, in the Slack channel. Um, so yeah, that's one other thing we're hoping to do with this kind of group is, do some more informal things because uh, that's where a lot of interesting ideas happen actually. And they're hard to replicate when you don't have a forum for it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so much of what we do, the, the, the good stuff that comes out is serendipitous, right? It's people who yeah. meet from, from computer science or from business mm -hmm. or from Elliott school or Cochrane who just get together and say, Oh, what are you working on? What are you working on? And magic happens, you know, hard to do that online. Well, thank you again, Dex, for stopping by. We'll have Thanks you back again me. sometime. Uh, uh, Hassan, did you have a question? Or? Yeah. Oh, I have a question. Yes. 
Okay. Yeah, uh, 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 let me introduce myself a little bit. Uh, I'm a PhD student from mechanical engineering, and this is my first year in my program. And I'm really interested in the iCorp program. Okay. So I joined the CIS, uh, what's that name? Uh, showcase, yeah. But the R&D showcase, yes. Yeah, R&D showcase uh, last two years, but this year it has been canceled yes. for some reason. Yeah, so, and I have some new idea about my research and I want to join the iCorp program to, so I would like to know some details, how can I apply for this program and how it works for us. Yes, so, so you should definitely do that. It, it the 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 short answer to your question is there's, go to our website, innovate.gwu.edu, and you'll see the i uh, tab. Reach out to me. I mean, we can do something offline or, or send me an email. What you, okay. should, what you should do first, though, is to sign up for the next, uh, the introductory workshop, which is uh, it's every, the third Friday of every month. The next one is October 16th. It's a three-hour introduction. That's mm -hmm. the first step for everybody. If if you like it and you want to continue, then there are two follow-on programs. If you think that's enough, then you can quit. But um, I would urge you to do that. And uh, if you want, um, I can follow up with you offline and give you more of the uh, how it works. And but okay, you would be more than welcome. And it sounds like a program that it's it's a program that's designed for people like you, frankly. Okay, sounds good. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, great. Um, All right. Thanks, Thank Lex. You. And the only other announcement that I had, um, and actually, I thought Lex might even mention it. That's why oh. I had him send it oh. out. Oh, if you're still there, Lex, you I can am. tell us. You have a hackathon coming up that I saw. I thought it was in one of the, your group's newsletters. We have set, oh, so we are doing one for um, uh, inclusion, inclusion and, and social justice on the 17th. Yes, I shame on me for not mentioning that. Uh, uh, this is this is something that's it's it's run by an external group that, um, that they and they're doing them all over the country on that same day. Um, but yes, it's it's and it's well suited to your your folks, of course. Um, it, it it's the standard hackathon format where folks come in and kind of a challenge and lay out some of the issues and then um, give give folks some instructions on how to do some some ideation and creativity and then turn them loose for you know, half a day to see if they can produce some kind of a, a hack that might uh, might address some of the some of the issues around inclusion and social justice. So thanks yeah, for bringing that up. Can you send a on. registration link? Can you put that on Slack in the, I guess, in the volunteer opportunities I area? Will. That might be good. Um, yes, thank you for uh, great. reminding me, Ryan. All right, I'm gonna quit then. Thank you guys, enjoyed it very much. Okay. Bye bye. Okay, Thanks, John, nice. and do you want to take over then? Sure, I will share my screen and we'll get started with some shiny things. Can y'all see my slides now? Yes. Okay. All right. So um, I'm John Helveston. Uh, I'm a professor in engineering management and systems engineering. And today I want to talk about. R Shiny apps. So I'm a big R enthusiast. Most of my courses I teach are taught in R. Um, and this is actually slides uh, from one of my lessons from my class that I taught last spring, which I'll be teaching again next spring. Uh, the course is on exploring data. It's called exploratory data analysis. Um, uh, this lecture sort of comes later in the semester. You can see it was March. This was actually the first one we did online. Um, and uh, it's, it's when we're, now that we've got some data sort of cleaned up, we have some analysis, but we want to show it to the world, or we want to have a user that can have an interactive experience with it, like choosing different pieces of it and visualizing it interactively. So that's what these shiny apps are for. Um, they sort of create interactive dashboards, things like that. Um, so anyway, uh, before I jump into it, you can get the links I, to all of this. I posted in the events channel on Slack. Um, so the links to the slides um, and also the links um, to the files that I'm going to be showing. So I have a, my RStudio up with some files in it already that have some code and things that I'm going to be just displaying. 
Um, in class, I would have my students like write the code in real time, but I'm just going to display it for you to see how it works today. But all of this stuff is available publicly um, and you get it from my course site. So here's my course site. Um, it's called eda.cs.gw.edu. So that's my exploratory data analysis course. And here's the schedule. And this was, this was uh, week nine or no, um, week 12, shiny app. So you can click the slides or the notes there. Um, these are not my original slides also. I got them from uh, someone I found on Twitter. Um, uh, so this is from this amazing uh, researcher. Her name is Florencia D'Andrea. And I saw her post her slide deck on Twitter and I said, well, these are really cool. Can I use them in my class? This was like February, right? So I was about to teach this class in, within a month. And she was like, yeah, no problem. Um, and you know, this came about from a sort of larger group called um, Our Ladies. And it's a, it's largely like over Twitter, I think is where most people sort of organize, but it is a, um, it is like a, an R group uh, that was been organized by women all over the world. And it is a, an amazing organization that is kind of loosely like ours, like just a loose network of, of programmers and coders um, who promote inclusivity across uh, coding and programming. And, regularly just post amazing things of all the work uh, that people are doing all over the world. So these are her slides and you can actually see them. These are her actual slides. Um, there's a link to them. But I, I uh, we took them and sort of took pieces of it and remade it for my class. So thanks to Florencia for putting this awesome content out. Okay, so that's my disclaimer. Um, but we'll jump in. I want to start by just showing some examples of what a Shiny app is and just some cool Project. So here's a COVID tracker. Of course, you're going to have a COVID tracker. Um, but this is an interactive map, you know, of the world. It shows cases by country. And it's interactive, right? So I can, you know, click on things and see the data pop up. Like here's the US. It tells you information. Uh, this looks like it's not been updated in quite a long time, because <laughs> that's not right. <laughs> um, anyway, or maybe it is, I'm not sure. But um, so there's a lot of these different, you know, COVID trackers, um, and you can see different aspects. So here's the raw data. Um, here's the map. All right. So that's just one example. Um, sorry, it looks like my thing zoomed out on me. Um, this was a, a fun dashboard for conferences. So you can, um, when you go to a conference, people usually tweet with a specific hashtag for the conference. And you can use it to like see uh, what's going on across the conference, like who's tweeting the most. So this is loading the app. I'll let this one load. I think it's going to take a little bit. Um, here, let's see another one. Medicare spending app. Um, maybe I'm overloading everything because it's taking too long. There you go. Medicare spending. Um, so you can peruse the data here and you can learn stuff about states. So you get the sense for what, you know, what these apps are. Um, and uh, there's a lot more of them. There's a shiny gallery where you can see a bunch of different, like lots of apps that people have put together. And some of them get very sophisticated. I mean, they, uh, this one is like a machine learning app. Um, and there's a competition that's run every year by our studio. And it's just gotten really, really impressive um, how complicated and, uh, and sophisticated some of these apps have become. But they all start with a pretty simple foundation. So I'm just going to be showing a very bare bones of how you can create an app. And, um, and then uh, you'll see how, you know, all of these more complex functionality are, are added upon them. Um, if this was my class, uh, this is how we would read in some data. So we're going to be talking about two examples, federal spending. So it's some data on uh, R&D spending across different federal agencies and milk production. So milk production across U.S. states over time. Um, we'll get into them. But um, <clears throat> this is the, the, what we're going to cover, just the basic structure and then talk about the differences of how you design a user interface and how you design a a server. That's the two main pieces of, a, of an app. And feel free to interrupt me too, by the way, if, if, if you want me to, you know, recover anything or you have any questions. Um, 
So to get started, um, if you've quick. never John, used... Are the data John, set? I apologize. Yes. I came in late, but I do have one clarifying question. Mm -hmm. um, is this one piece of R, a particular area of R? I, I'm unfamiliar with R, but I heard that R was for uh, programming with data statistics and analysis. Yeah, so I, that's a perfect segue into what I was going to talk about right now, um, was that R is a language. It's a programming language that is frequently used for data analysis. Um, then there's the environment called RStudio, which is the, the program that most people use to interact with R. So here is my R studio, and it looks like this. Um, so this is my console, which has anything I run is going to run over there. I can run any R code I want in the console. And then this is the script of code that I'm actively working with. Um, you know, so this, this does computations for me, right? That's what, um, so just like any computing language, if uh, um, uh, R is the fundamental language, R Studio is this interface, this application that helps me organize my code. Um, so we're going to be working with this. And Shiny is a library. It's an external library. So that's what this was about. R is the language. Shiny is this external library that has all sorts of new functionality. Um, so the base R can't do any of these things that I'm about to show you to make stuff interactive. Um, Shiny allows you to build these user interfaces that uh, work inside a web browser. So you open up a browser and then you can see um, your data in different ways. So it's still kind of fundamentally data analysis, but most of what Shiny is doing is exposing that to a user. So um, taking some analysis maybe you've already done and allowing the user to peruse it interactively. So just like that, um, the COVID map that I showed, you know, you have an interactive map of the, United, of the whole world and you can zoom in and click on countries and see data about what's going on. Um, so that's what Shiny is. So it's separate from the language. It's just built on the language. And other languages, I mean, Python has uh, similar packages for building these interactive applications. Most languages have those. This one is mostly just um, it sort of focuses around data analysis or data visualization. I think, did you have a question, uh, Ryan, or? I just said, ask if the data sets were available on your class website, if we wanted to try to run yeah. the same data that you're running. Right, yeah, so the, this, the files for what I'm looking at here, um, it, uh, it, you'll see all of this stuff. Um, all these um, code files, these .r files or code files, and then the data themselves. You can get all of that on the website where it says, this, uh, which week is this? Week 12, there's the slides are here and the notes. The notes blank don't have any code in them. The notes complete have the completed examples. So I'm looking at the completed ones, but I posted all the links to this also in the events channel. Um, I'll go ahead and just copy paste it over to the Zoom channel if people want to see it quickly. Um, so you can follow along. I'll open up the chat. There you go. So you can see the slides in the code there. This is going to download a zip file, the completed notes. And if you want to see what I'm seeing, like this whole thing, you want to go to the, the downloaded. Uh, this is what all the files are going to look like when you unzip them. And you want to open up this thing called the R project file. So this is going to open up R Studio, and then you'll be able to see what what I'm seeing. Um, of course, you have to install R and R Studio for this to work on your machine. So if you haven't done that already, this won't work yet. You got to go install both of those things, um, and you have to install these libraries too. So there's some external libraries, including Shiny. Like you have to run this little snippet of code, install packages, Shiny to get it working on your machine. So um, if you can do that quick enough, you can follow along in real time. But if not, we're going to post this video anyway on YouTube. So you can install all those things later and follow along again then to see um, how things work. Um, OK. So um, the basic idea of what a Shiny app is, um, is it's a web page. Right, it opens up in your browser. 
and it has some user interface. So something that the user sees, like some inputs and some plots and things like this. But you have to have a computer driving that interface. All right, if I click on something, that's, that requires the, some other computer to interact. It has to, when I click somewhere, it's telling the computer to do something and it's gonna send more information back. So there's two parts. There's a user interface and then there's a server, some computer somewhere that is serving information to my app, to my website. Um, and when we build them locally on our computer, the server is your computer, right? So you can have your laptop open and your laptop is your server. Um, so for now, any, all the apps we're gonna make are just local apps that only work on my machine. Um, and you can, you can make them work anywhere by publishing them to the web, but that takes a little more effort. For now, I'm just gonna talk about, you know, how to use your own computer as a server. Um, <clears throat> so the basic structure, um, Rather than talk about this, I think it's easier just to show you an example. So here is a very simple example. I'll zoom in so you can see this. Um, I have to load the library, shiny. I have to define some user interface and I have to define some server. Um, the user interface, when you define things in R, you use this little arrow symbol. So it's saying like, whatever this is, I'm assigning it to this object called UI. And over here, I'm assigning something else to this thing called server. And then I'm gonna run the whole app by merging those together, a UI and a server. Um, so that's, that's the simple app. And again, you know, what's, what's going on with what I'm assigning to it, if you've never seen R, or if you've never seen any programming, um, don't worry too much about what's going on here yet. We'll, we'll talk about it. But um, I wanna just show you an example. To, I think it's easier to see it run. So here is uh, a simple one. It's called Hello Shiny. It's the first simple app I've, that uh, you can load. It's, uh, it's also an example that you can get from uh, the RStudio site. They provide the same example. Um, so what's going on is this is the stuff defining my user interface. Looks like a lot going on there, but we'll break it down into pieces. And then I have this whole other section here defining what my server is doing. And then I'm gonna run that together. So let me show you the whole thing first. If I just highlight all the code and hit run, it's gonna run all of this together. And this is what you're gonna see. My app pops up and this is my user interface. So this is my app, it's a very simple app. All it does is show me a histogram of some data and I can change the bin size. So I can make it have fewer bins or I can make it have more bins. So you see that this is interactively adjusting to the user setting. So what you're looking at is the user interface. So what you see here, this slider bar, this plot, and this title, all of that is being defined by this little user interface part. What's making it you know, do things, what you're seeing, the fact that it's changing as I, as I move this slider up and down, that's being controlled by this little server. So we can break down these little pieces. Um, um, I should, I should put this on a separate thing so it's easier to see. Um, all right, so I think you can see the code and the app at the same time here now. There, side by side. Okay, so, um, hang on. The user interface, I like to think of it like the, the little Russian dolls um, because you have like uh, pieces that are all nested inside each other. So, so that's the visual. Um, so if you look at the way this, this whole user interface works, you see all these different pieces that are indented with parentheses. These are all separate little functions and they're all sort of nested inside each other. Um, so this outer one called fluid page, this is saying, I want my page to be fluid. I can put things anywhere. Um, then I'm gonna add a title uh, that just says hello world. So that's the title defined right there. Then I'm gonna have this broader thing called a sidebar layout. So the, the overall layout is gonna have something that has a sidebar over here and some other stuff over here, the main input. So I have to define what's in the sidebar and what's inside the main. So here you go, my sidebar panel is gonna have a thing called a slider. So slider input, and this is the stuff defining the slider. So it's gonna go from one to 50. Um, the starting value is gonna be 30. So you can see that here, it's going from one to 50 and it's gonna start at 30 when I run the app. 
Uh, and then the main panel is just going to uh, give me a title. That's what this is. Bar plot of number of bins. And then some plot. It says plot output. So it's going to put this plot right here. So the user interface is just telling you where things go, what things are there. Um, the server is going to be the thing defining this interactivity. So what is the plot? You know, what, what plot is going to go here? So there's nothing about a histogram up here, right? It's just saying, put a plot right here. Then I have to tell R, okay, I want you to put which plot. So the server is doing all the calculations. It's, uh, it's a bit more messy looking, um, but all it's doing is saying, uh, I'm gonna take some data called faithful, which is data on old faithful, um, the geyser, um, the, waiting, the waiting times um, for old faithful geyser. I'm going to calculate some number of bins and then I'm going to plot a histogram. So hist is a histogram function in R. So this server is going to be constantly doing this computation over and over and over. So every time I change something, it's going to recalculate that plot. So that, that's all this is doing is just recalculating a plot every time I touch, every time the user touches this and, and changes it. And so you can see that there's two sort of, two modes in the waiting times of old faithful geysers. Um, okay, so that's my so, so real quick, John, app. just for people. Mm -hmm. um, if you're less familiar with our the faithful dollar sign waiting, can you describe what yeah. that's for if people haven't worked in R? Because we don't do that in Python. To fix that. No. So faithful is a built in data set. It's just, it comes when you open up R. I didn't read it in or anything, it's just existing data. And it has timing data about uh, how long the Old Faithful eruptions occurred for and how long you had to wait between them. Um, so, so this is the data set. It's just an, a, an example data set and it's you know 270 rows long of, of that information. Um, so then if you wanted to access one of these variables, like in this case, I'm plotting the waiting time. Um, so there's these two variables, eruptions and waiting. I can access the waiting one using this dollar sign thing. So this is a data frame, if you're familiar with data frames. And I'm saying, give me the waiting column. So just give me this one right here. So that's all of those numbers. So that's what I'm plotting. I'm plotting a histogram of all of those numbers. And if you put hist around that, you'll see the histogram pop up. All right, so that's, that's what's defining the, um, the plot that's being shown in the, in the app. So when, if I'm actually going to build an, an app in real time, what I would do first is figure out the code that I need to make this plot. And then I'm just going to make insert that code over here. So all the other stuff here is just telling it to look a little different, like change the color, give it a label, give it a title, that kind of thing. But fundamentally it's just saying compute the histogram of X. And in this case, X is this data. Um, so uh, the, the, the key to the interactivity in this part is, you know, how do I link the slider value to the number of bins? Um, so if I, uh, that's this breaks equals bins argument. So I can say breaks equals like 10 and it's gonna give me 10. If I give it breaks equals 20, now I have 20 little bars. So you can see I'm manually changing the breaks. If I want to have a, you know, a more uh, spread out histogram, I can increase the number of breaks. It looks like 20 might be the max here. Yeah, on this simple example. Um, so the slider is really just updating that number. It's coming from this little input thing. Input, hash, input dollar sign bins, that's what my slider is called. So I have a slider input called bins. The, the name of this thing I have called bins. And down here, I'm saying, I want to calculate the number of bins um, uh, using this little sequence function. So this is gonna create a sequence of numbers to, to tell me how many bins I need to have. So that's the link to make it interactive. If I didn't have this, this little link, then wherever I slid that slider bar, nothing would change. But that's the piece that's, that's varying inside my app. Okay, so there's, there's a lot of uh, moving parts in even this simple example, right? But the way you sort of build them is you, you first define what you want the user to see. 
just what is your vision of, of what the user should be doing? I want a slider bar here and I want to show some plot here of a histogram. And I usually do that with a piece of paper. I like sketch out little boxes of like, what do I want and where do I want it to be on a page? And then you have to sit down and think about how do I write the code to display that information? Um, how do I make a histogram? So that's some of this code here that's displaying a histogram. And how do I make those things interactive? How do I link them? Well, you have to take, take something from the input number that you're giving it, whether it's a slider bar or text or other, other types of inputs and link them to your plot. So whatever you're plotting, uh, this number is gonna, this thing bins is gonna be changing as I vary that slider. Um, Can I ask a, a higher level question? Yeah. Since I'm, I'm new to programming. So in Python, Python works very well for automating a service or a function that would normally require lots of um, manual inputs. Um, and then it looks like R's Shiny uh, mm -hmm. program is very good for displaying um, in a visual format a lot of data analysis. So can, so can Shiny write on top of Python? Um, and, that's... And, also, and also, I just want to clarify, is, is Shiny only for display on a web browser? Right, so I'll answer the second one first. So Shiny um, is essentially yes, the answer, the answer to that question is basically yes. You, it's going to display your app in a web browser. In fact, when I run my app, the thing that pops up is sort of RStudio's internal little browser but you can also say open in browser. So if I click this button, it's gonna open it up. So here it is inside my web browser. And um, so it's, 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 it's built so that um, it can be published on a website somewhere. So I, I think you might've joined just a bit late to see some of the examples I showed, but um, there were some examples at the, at the top here where like here was a shiny COVID tracker. Yeah, um, I saw those. Right. So this is, this is a live app now. So if I, I could run this locally on my own computer, but this has been published to a website now and they've made the link between some uh, remote server that's, that has R built on it and that R server is interacting with what I'm seeing. So there is some underlying data set. It looks like this. <laughs> this is the underlying data and you could download it right here if you want it. Um, but this person, whoever built this has, um, has spent the time to make this sort of interactive display so that I can click on things and different data is going to be displayed. So it is fundamentally uh, like a web interface. That's the design. That's the way it's designed. And, and yes, you actually can link these things together where you have a Python sort of backend that does a lot of work for you up, up front and then have a shiny app that's built on top of everything so that what's shown to the user is something really pretty and nice like this. That is something I've actually seen a few different times. It's actually one of the one of the ways that you can bring Python and R together in a very like harmonious way. Because R is pretty good at a lot of this visual stuff. Uh, data visualization is like what a lot of people use it for. Yep. And, okay. Great. Thanks. Yeah. So it's um, it is it can be a harmonious relationship those two. And there's actually whole libraries that are built for merging that together. Um, Okay, so um, I'll go back to where I was in my slide. Sorry for the dizziness here. Um, so that little example gave you a, a quick uh, sketch out of the whole, the big picture. Here's how you build a whole app. Here's how they link together. Um, I wanna spend a little time now thinking about the pieces. Oh wow, it's already 11.50, so <laughs> maybe that's all we're gonna do. Um, I usually have like a two hour class for this. Um, but, but one, just, just as a quick example, I'll just stick with this one example so we can see it. So you see the very first thing in my user interface is this thing called fluid page um, uh, that has a title and then some other thing called sidebar layout. Sidebar layout is this particular layout, right? There's a side panel and there's some main panel. So the example we saw, we had a little slider bar and we had a histogram here. There's all these other types of layouts. 
So this is where it, it's sort of built like Legos. Like you, you build a, you grab the layout you want and then you fill in the pieces you want in that Lego. So this is why I think of that visual of the, the little Russian dolls because you have the outer thing, the outer layer would be like sidebar layout. And then inside that you've got a sidebar and a main panel. And then inside the sidebar, I'm gonna put a slider and inside the main, I'm gonna put a graph. Um, so there's lots of flexibility on how you can design that interface and I usually, again, start with a simple, you know, pen and paper of sketching out what I want the user to see, what do I want that to look like. Um, and then you just start putting these pieces in. Um, so there's my Russian, Russian doll picture of a sidebar layout. You see what I mean um, by these little dolls and what goes inside them. Um, and there's lots of different inputs, right? So we just showed that one, that slider. But there's each of these little functions define a different type of input. So slider input is, is this one. You can click and drag a slider around. You can give dates. You can take text. You can pick colors. Um, you can have buttons, just like you click a button and then something happens. Um, radio buttons, drop down boxes. So kind of anything you can think about. You can even allow people to upload information. So if you have like a file upload, uh, you can click that and then the user can upload a file. So lots of different. These are all called widgets, um, widgets for getting information from the user. And then the server is going to take that information and do something with it. Um, so this, this code just displays a few of the, a few of the widgets. So I'm just going to run it just so you can see like how this kind of looks in, in real time. So all I did was redefine the, the UI and now I'm going to run my app again and it's going to look differently. Whoops. So now my user interface looks totally different, right? I, all I did was I, I didn't, I, do, I, writ, I wrote over this. I said, drop this, let's use this code. This code shows me, whoops, an action button, a submit button, a drop down box, some check boxes, I can pick a date. So these are all things that we're, we're all pretty familiar with if you've used any website ever, you know, they have these sorts of little features. Um, and you can get different interactivity, like I wanna, plot something, but I want to only plot these two versions. I don't want to plot the third one. Then you could allow the user to control that, right? By, by clicking things. So obviously I don't have a server connected to this, right? So you can, you can play with the user interface all day without any server. You can just put stuff in there and see what it looks like. And nothing's going to happen when I click the buttons and I do things. Um, they're just allowing me to visualize what it's going to look like, what the out, what the, what the, you know, overview of how my app is going to look. And if you look at that code, it's, it's again, this little nested structure. Here I have a fluid page and then I have a fluid row with different columns. And so I have four different columns. Each column is gonna have a different thing. And this one has some buttons. This one has a selection drop down. So you can see I'm defining four, four choices. This is a checked box. So there's three choices of checks box. And this was a date, a date input. Um, so that's what we all just saw. Um, and there's a picture, a snapshot of what it looks like. Um, I'm gonna skip past all of this. So this is just sort of giving a little more detail of, of how that user interface looks like. And if I was, if you were taking my class, we would then go build one of these things in real time. Um, so I wanna spend more time on the, on the server now. Um, on the, the example that I showed you with this little histogram, um, the main function here for, for this, this one server is render plot. All right, so I have over here, I've, I've, in the UI, I've said, I want a plot to go here. I want, in this main panel, I want to stick a plot here. And I've used this thing called plot output. Uh, and I've given it a name. This, this plot is going to be called dist plot. Uh, I don't know why. Uh, this is what we chose. <laughs> um, so then down in my server, I have to say, what is dist plot? What is this thing? I have to define that object. So down here, there's a, the, output dollar sign this plot. Um, this is where I'm saying I want to plot, I want to, I want to load a plot into that object. So I want it to be in my main panel and I'm going to load it with this thing called render plot. So render plot is just a wrapper. So this, this is just normal R code that makes a histogram. And then I've wrapped around that. I've said, I want you to render this plot. I want you to take this image that you're generating and display it to this output. So that's, that's the key thing for getting it to show up uh, in, um, in my app. 
And there's a bunch of different render functions. You can render tables, you can render plots, images, um, um, even that map, that interactive COVID map, that is really just rendering an image. Um, that's a rendering an, a, a plot uh, in real time. So a bunch of different types of, of objects you want to render, depending what you want to show someone, there's different types of like render this, render that. Um, so, so the, these things are sort of parallel. They have a parallel um, sort of feel. There's, uh, if you're making a plot, the, in the UI, you want to have something called plot output. And in the server, you want to have a thing called render plot. But you could also have it say like, show me some text. Then I might say, give me like a text output. And I'm going to call this thing, uh, I'm sorry, my output ID is going to be, I don't know, some text. That's the name of it. So then down here, I need to have an, another output called output uh, text. That's this object name. And it's going to be called I don't know, render, render text, I think, render text. Um, and I'm just going to say, I don't know, foo, Let's see if this works. Yeah, there's some text down here called foo. <laughs> So, um, so that's, that's the way these things work. Whatever you stick inside the UI, you can have some output thing in the server that's going to render something to it. And if I wanted this to be interactive, I could, I could make this an input. I could say, make it um, over in that sidebar, the user puts some text in, and then it displays that text over here. OK, so um, this example was, was showing how you can just different, different um, uh, a different app with some different data set. Uh, it looks like this. I'll, I'll show it to you here. It's this federal spending one. So I'm going to read in this data on federal spending. Whoops. I know an, another library called read CSV. Uh, so here's my federal spending data. Looks like this. I have different US departments. I have the year and how much their R&D budget was. And here, my, my user interface is just telling me I want to select something. So I'm going to have a, I want to select which department I want to show. And then I'm going to put a plot, a bar plot of the spending of that, of that um, agency. And then my server, it's taking which one I, which, which department did I choose? And then it's going to show um, uh, a, a bar plot. That's, this code is just making a bar plot. I think I'm actually going to have to load this other this full tidyverse library for this to run there. Um, yeah. Could not find. <laughs> Sorry, there's other libraries that we, we built this one uh, uh, without having all my libraries loaded. So just a second. Sorry. Other libraries that are required for this particular app. Okay. So here it's just showing a different you know, type of user interface. It's a drop down menu. I can select one of the departments and I can look at their R&D budget over time. Um, so like NIH, the federal spending on healthcare has dramatically increased since like 2000. Um, okay. So that's, that's that example. And then the milk production was a very um, similar example showing where you can choose which region you wanna watch and you look at and then you can show different milk production by state in that region. So we're, we're pretty much out of time. Um, but you can download all of these. Like I said, I wrote, you've got all the links now if you want to download these examples. It includes the data as well in those files. Um, and you can install all these libraries and, uh, and play with it if you want. Um, I would also just recommend that you go check out the, um, the Shiny Gallery page. So go to our studio, our shiny.rstudio.com, and you can see, I'll put this in the chat as well. You can see lots of cool examples of other applications that people have built. So you can get a sense for the variety of ways you can you know, display uh, different types of data. Um, all sorts of tools. People have even built games. They've just built like you know, Tetris and other, other games this way. Um, so they're, they're, all, they're all here, and, and this is where I got most of my ideas. You know, most of the time when I build an app, I go here first, and I look for an example of something that looks like what I want to build, and then I look at that code and see how did they do that, and like, 
you know, how did they display something that's a map of some with some data overlaid over it? Then I'm going to go find. Um, so this is, an, you know, here's an example where you've got a map. Uh, you can select different regions and it's going to show me some stuff overlaid on that. Well, I'll go find the code that they used um, to make this and uh, and then copy paste it and, and start playing with it until I get something similar. Okay, um, so that's all I have Thank for shiny you. apps. Um, and I've never taken a class on shiny apps. <laughs> so everything I've learned was by doing what I just said, going to the web, looking for examples and you know, hacking it away until I figured out how it worked. Cool. All right. I'm going to try uh, once I get. Hey, well, thank Python you, everyone, again, for joining us. Combine the two. Yeah. Really liked it. Thank you. Cool. All right. We'll post this thing to YouTube. Yep. And too, keep and your eye on Slack. We'll be posting stuff. Yeah, we'll post everything to Slack for you. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. Sweet. Okay. Um, hey, see I everyone next it. week, hopefully. Yeah. All right. See you. Bye.